indeed for that um, kind introduction. So perhaps I should just state how this um, event is going to run. We're first of all going to have a, a straw poll. Then I'm going to introduce the speakers. The speakers are then each going to talk for 10 minutes. And uh, by 10 minutes, I mean 10 minutes. We're going to be quite strict as far as the timing is concerned. And then we're going to throw it open to uh, discussion. And we hope you'll have plenty of uh, questions and comments to ask the panelists. And towards the end, we'll ask the um, panelists to sort of uh, sum up and give us their concluding uh, reflections. Perhaps each will speak for about two or three minutes. And we'll have another straw poll to see whether opinion has shifted in either direction. OK, so could I now um, move to the straw poll? Um, the question is whether the, um, the UK should leave the EU. Now, could I ask if you think um, the um, UK should leave the EU, would you be kind enough to raise your hand? So, would you like to count? So about 10. Okay. Uh, can I ask uh, those who think the UK should stay in the EU, please raise your hand. <laughs> so how many are... Well, I already know who's going to win the debate. <laughs> oh, oh, but will, will we... Uh, no, but I mean in terms of shift. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> Uh, 50, 53, 55, 57, 58, 60, I would say 65, and someone else, yes, yeah, 65. How many and how many, sorry? And how many are undecided? Okay, excellent. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, I think. It. Okay, so we'll... Uh, take another straw poll at the end, and it'll be very interesting to see how opinion has shifted, if indeed it does shift. Now, perhaps I can introduce our speakers. I'll introduce them in alphabetical order. First of all, um, Rebecca Driver, um, who runs the um, research consultancy Analytically Driven uh, Limited. Um, she previously uh, spent six years as Director of Research and Chief Economist at the Association of British Insurers, and before that she was for nearly eight years at the Bank of England, where she was Research Advisor to the external um, members of the Monetary Policy Committee of the um, Bank of England. She's been a Research Fellow in the Economics Department of both Exeter and Strathclyde Universities, and has written for the Economist Intelligence Unit. She has a PhD from the University of Exeter, and she has recently authored a report uh, which was commissioned in City UK entitled Analyzing the Case for EU Membership, How Does the Economic Evidence Stack Up? And I think what you'll be saying today will be uh, based on, on that report, and uh, you'll find details of how uh, you can acquire the report if you want to do so. Secondly, on my right is uh, Simon Hicks, who's the Harold Lasky Professor of Political Science at the LSE, and uh, he can be described as one of Britain's foremost political scientists, and he is a fellow of the British Academy. He's the author of a number of books on the European Union. For example, The Political System of the European Union, Democratic Politics in the European Parliament, and What's Wrong with the European Union and How to Fix It. He's the founder and chairman of votewatch.eu and is a senior fellow in the ESRC's UK in a Changing Europe programme. Okay, now on my far left, and that's a statement <laughs> as far as um, location is concerned, not, uh, as, uh, not a statement about his political beliefs, as I think should become evident uh, in due course, is uh, Patrick Minford, who uh, is currently Professor of Applied Economics at the Cardiff Business School, and he was Edward Garner Professor of Applied Economics at the University of Liverpool from 1976 to 1997. He has a PhD from the LSE and has worked for the Ministry of Overseas Development. 
A distinguished macroeconomist, he has published countless books and articles, including a co-authored book, Should Britain Leave the EU? An Economic Analysis of a Troubled Relationship, which appeared in 2005. He tells me that a second edition is about to hit the press, and um, I think in a month or two's, two's time, you'll be able to buy that book, and I'm sure you all want to do that. I think Patrick... Um, achieved particular prominence in the early 1980s, where he was, I think, one of the few economists who um, supported Margaret Thatcher's economic policies. And there is a story that um, Michael Foote asked Margaret Thatcher in Prime Minister's Question Time to name two economists who supported her economic policies. And she said, Patrick Minford and Alan Walters, Apparently, uh, when she was being driven back to um, 10 Downing Street, she said, thank God he didn't ask me to name three. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, and um, for, last but not least, of course, uh, we have um, Graham Stringer, who was uh, first elected to the House of Commons in 1997. Um, your Labour MP for Blakely and Broughton, did I pronounce that well, correctly? Did. I was warned that uh, um, uh, this was um, not too easy. You serve on the European Scrutiny Committee. Prior to entering Parliament, um, he served as leader of Manchester City Council from 1984 to 1996. I think you're one of the few MPs who have a scientific background and you have a degree in chemistry from Sheffield University. So um, that's our panel. We are uh, delighted to have you all here and delighted that you're able to contribute to this uh, discussion. So, um, and we're very much looking forward to your, um, to your contributions. Okay, so um, perhaps um, we can start. Um, oh, the order in which people will speak will have the, uh, it may be um, apparent that we have sort of two economists, a political scientist and um, a, um, an MP. So. Um, perhaps the economist obviously um, might focus more on the economic case and then we'll perhaps have more discussion of the political case, though who knows how it's going to, uh, to go. So Rebecca Driver will, will start and then uh, we'll have Patrick Minford, then Simon Hicks and finally uh, Graham, Graham Stringer. So perhaps I could ask um, Rebecca Driver to kick off. Good evening. I was asked earlier what do analytically driven do? We're a research consultancy that specialises in answering policy questions. I got into the EU question because the City UK asked me to take a look at how do economies work and what does that mean for the UK's relationship with the EU? Are we better off out or in? And kind of one 100 page report later, I think basically. The case for EU membership can be boiled down to five fairly empirically strong facts. Fact number one is that there are big, big differences between the productivity enjoyed by high productivity firms and low productivity firms in all industries and all countries around the world. So to give you a sense of scale, in the US that's around a factor of two, India and China it's around a factor of five, the UK will sit somewhere in the middle of that. Those high productivity firms are really important for your economy. It's easy to see why allocative efficiency means that if you hand more resources to high productivity firms, then you're going to produce more with those resources. So it matters who you're giving those resources to but it also matters in terms of a learning by seeing effect. If you look at productivity convergence, um, firms that are, um, have low productivity tend to converge to the firms that have high productivity within a country rather than firms sort of that are the productivity leader internationally. So it matters which firms they can see. The other thing that we know empirically is that crossing a border is really, really expensive. And we can see that looking at the example of the US and Canada, for example. If you look at trade between Canadian provinces and trade between US states and then compare trade between Canada and the US, you will find that Canadian provinces trade far more with another province that's far much further away than they do 
by simply crossing the border. A border matters from a trade perspective. The other fact that we observe is that only high productivity firms can afford to trade, and certainly when you look empirically at who are the most productive and the most innovative firms in any economy, they tend to be those who are involved in international activity, be that either as exporters or through foreign direct investment. And because it's expensive to trade, these firms prioritize the markets that they're interested in. They like large, geographically close markets with strong institutions and developed financial markets. Empirically, that's the sort of market that firms prefer to trade in, and from a UK perspective, that means the EU. So why does it matter? Well, in some sense, you could say it doesn't matter. Only 11% of UK firms trade. But these firms are actually really important for the UK economy. Um, they are much, much more productive than their non-exporting um, compatriots. And if you look at the data from 1996 to 2004, for example, where there's a study that breaks out what impact exporters versus non-exporters have on productivity growth, you find that 60% of productivity growth was generated by these 11% of firms. Furthermore, of the remaining 40%, most of that growth was of very, very low productivity firms going out of business rather than any sense of innovation within the non-exporting sector. And from the point of view of the exporters, the EU is a really key market. 80% of exporters export to EU countries. And if you're, you've been in the business of trading a long time, that rises to about 95%. And in total, the EU accounts for around 50% of UK trade. But it's not just the EU market that matters. If you were to leave the EU, there are also a raft of preferential trade agreements with other countries that you would need to renegotiate um, in order to try and maintain the same type of trading agreements that you currently have in place. At the moment, that accounts for just over 60% of UK goods trade, but there's another 23.6% of trade um, kind of with countries that are currently in the process of negotiating a preferential trade agreement with the EU. And given how expensive and complicated negotiating trade agreements are, they would much prefer to negotiate with the EU than they would with the UK. As I said, crossing a border is very expensive. Estimates suggest that in order to explain the extent to which trade falls off when you cross a border, it's equivalent in goods trade to about an ad valorem tax of 74%. It's costly. And when you move into the service sector, it's even more costly, roughly seven times that. Reducing trade costs has a big, big impact. The example I really like is the US-Canadian Trade Agreement of 1989, which from an economic experiment um, perspective is perfect and nobody expected it to be introduced um, and there were no macro measures included with it. It led to a 13.8% increase in Canadian productivity. In other words, reducing the costs of crossing a border can be extremely beneficial. Obviously, not all those costs are affected, but a lot of them will be, and particularly things like information costs if we leave the EU. Furthermore, it's not just that 11% of firms that matter. There are also the sort of issue of global supply chains, which are increase, increasingly complicated. Um, in the UK, only about 50% of value added for exports is generated in the sector of the exporter itself. You look at large Spanish firms, for example, that are doing exporting, only 1.5% of them um, generate all their inputs in-house in Spain. Supply chains are very complicated and hugely important. So in terms of the work that I did for the City UK, I looked at five different options um, for what out would look like. 
There's a sort of customs union single market type option, probably not very credible, um, but might be a sort of EU light um, type option if you were to think about it. There's membership of the customs union only, that's a Turkey type deal. You've got membership of the single market only, that's a Norway type deal, sometimes referred to <coughs> as government by fax. And then you've got the free trade agreement option, which is a Swiss option, um, tends to be very static deals. The Swiss, I think, have a huge number of deals with the EU. Interestingly, only one covers financial services, so a key sector of the UK could well be left out. Then, of course, you've got um, competing um, under World Trade Organization rules under most favored nation. All the options for EU exit would increase costs for exporters, and these costs are non-trivial. And the other thing to recognize is that EU negotiations, exit negotiations, will be difficult, and the EU will have an incentive to punish. So thinking that we can get as good a deal, particularly for controversial sectors like financial services, is difficult. In the report that I did, um, I looked at a whole load of questions from the point of view of firms that export and set them up so that you could answer them as a sort of yes-no option. Um, I don't intend to go through this um, slide in any detail. Um, it is in the report if you're interested. The EU <coughs> column is the one to my right, far right, and as you can see, it has by far the, the, the largest number of green yes options, which means that it's most beneficial from the point of view of the firms that are trading. Um, so, to give you an example of why the costs associated with Exit are real, um, rule of origins. Um, they apply to any free trade agreement. Um, a typical EU NAFTA free trade agreement will have a 200 page plus rule of origin um, type regulation. There are four different ways of calculating it. Some lucky goods get to have to comply with all four methods of calculations and the costs are non-trivial. So 8% compliance costs um, from trade, 6.8% increase in admin costs. Big impact on exports if those costs were put in place. Of course, a lot of people worry about EU regulation and it's not that EU regulations aren't costly. Um, Open Europe looked at the 100 most costly EU regulations, calculated they came to 27.4 billion pounds per annum. What they didn't really highlight was those same 100 regulations were calculated to have a benefit of 57.1 billion pounds per annum. In other words, the scope for cutting regulation when we leave it is probably quite limited, and certainly having sat in the ABI boardroom where you've got FTSE 100 CEOs sitting around the table, they're much more likely to fret about the UK gold-plating EU regulation than they are to fret about the EU gold-plating UK regulation. So in conclusion, EU membership benefits high productivity firms that trade, these firms are absolutely key for our growth and output, and they benefit from a preferential trade arrangement that they couldn't get under any of the out options. And it gives them access to a large geographically close market with strong institutions and a developed financial sector. The costs of exit would inevitably be a fall in productivity, a fall in innovation, investment and employment, and an increase in costs. Um, replacing the EU would be incredibly difficult. Um, doesn't mean, of course, that the EU can't be improved. It can be improved. But in my opinion, at least, the UK is better off in than out. Thank you. Um, yes, very interesting what Rebecca had to say. I was sitting there listening, and I thought, well, this is fascinating, you know, because we, we're told all these things, but I, I didn't, sometimes in a seminar I asked, where's the model? Where's the model that says all this? Where is the theory or the empirical evidence that says if we're not in something, something changes relative to being in it? 
And so I'm an economist like Rebecca, and I got a lot of models. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what the models say would happen if we left the EU. You know, trade models, models of the economy that embed regulation in them of different sorts, labor market regulations. Um, what happens if we have to join the euro? Because as you know, under the present setup of the EU, as, we, as the EU moves towards ever closer union, joining the euro is an compulsory part of the, of the deal, which brings with it bailout costs. So there's a bunch of things here that are very important in terms of counterfactual, if you like. What would happen if? And I heard Rebecca speaking, and I thought, well, that's great, but I don't understand the model. So let me tell you what I think the model is. And so, first of all, we're going to be a self-governing country outside the EU. I know a lot of self-governing countries. They seem to do OK. <laughs> That's the first point I make to you guys. What is it that says the UK is somehow unique in being unable to govern itself outside, um, you know, a bunch of neighbors? I asked the Japanese, I got a Japanese daughter-in-law, and I might say to her, why don't you think you should join in with you know, Indonesia and China and be governed by, partly by them? Or I could ask the US, you know, why don't you join in a federation of surrounding states where you've got a bit, joined, bit governed by Canada, a bit governed by the Russians, and a few, you know, and a few Mexicans on your governing council? I don't think they'd be too pleased. So, first point, it, it seems to me one should assume that it's possible to be a self-governing nation like these other guys. So, let's, let's kind of think, well, what, what have we got in the background here? Of course, the first thing to note is that when we joined the EU, it was something very different. When we had the referendum that I took part in in 1975, we joined something called the Common Market. And it was a very different thing. What is it now? It's a huge, it's a huge organization that has a single market, which is free movement, as we know, single currency, probably our opt-out is temporary. It has ever closer union as, a, as an aim. It wants to be a state. Now, you know, all through my life, I've been told, don't take any notes of what those guys in Europe say. They don't mean it that they want to be a state. What do I observe today? There's banking union, there's all sorts of things for union on the on the agenda in Europe because of the Euro crisis, they want to be a state. It needs to be taken deadly seriously because that's what they mean. We have always in Britain underestimated the earnestness of the Euro people's desire to be a state. And so my basic point is there's some contradiction here between us as a self-governing country wanting to run, us, run our own affairs you know, traditionally, we've been always quite a bullshit bunch of people, always wanting to run ourselves, you know, Magna Carta, Civil Wars, Cromwell. And now we are, we are in a situation by kind of mistake, really, because we didn't join this thing. It's going to be like a ratchet. We've been in a, in, a, in, a, in a thing that has ratcheted up the state's business. And every time we say, oh, well, it'll probably improve, you know, let's, let's go along with it, because we love our European friends, you know, we don't want to be cause a terrible nuisance of ourselves. And now we're in this situation where these guys want to be a state and actually run us. And I, I don't know about you, but I don't always agree with what they want us to do. So that's an in interesting point, you see. And so I would say, we're not talking really about Brexit, we're talking about how a self-governing country, the UK, might rejig its relationships with all these neighbors. I call it preset. And, um, you know, it's pretty clear to me that Mr. Cameron won't get a preset because he's already told us he's virtually asking for nothing. Now, I did quite a lot of modeling on this, and I came up with various costs. First of all, obviously there's the obvious contribution of our membership fee, which is about half a percent of GDP. It's not chicken fee even if you net out the so-called beneficial spending by the EU here. Then you go into trade. Now, you know, I'm kind of old-fashioned trade-applied person. I've got models of trade, and in these models, competition rules in the long run, this is a big structural change leaving a customs union. 
My mentor at LSE, Professor Harry Johnson, argued strongly in the 1975 referendum against joining a customs union because he said, you're better off under free trade. Now the thing is, all the things that Rebecca said about trade don't take account of the fact that the EU is a customs union, very protectionist. The average rate of protection in the EU of agriculture is about 18%. The equivalent of tariff equivalent of all their non-tariff barriers and their tariffs on manufacturing is about the same. Now I've done the assumptions that over time this will come down to about 10%, and I get that leaving a highly protectionist area for world trade and world prices gives us a big gain. And a way to think about that is, as was mentioned in a newspaper earlier this week, on day one, the cost of living in the UK on leaving the EU will fall by 8%. And that is a huge change. And of course it's offset by the fact that the benefit to consumers is offset by the fact that a lot, of, a lot of industries, as Rebecca said, are very much benefited by the EU because of course they're protected. And, you know, turkeys don't vote for Christmas. So there's going to be a lot of turkeys out there, corporate turkeys, not voting to leave the EU, because that will be Christmas for them. They will lose a lot of protection. And that, that includes people in the city, it includes a lot of big manufacturers. But you see, free trade means we get competition. We get world prices, and we follow our comparative advantage. And it gives us a gain of 4% of GDP, because the misallocation in the British economy due to the EU favoring national, you know, these manufacturing champions and agriculture is massive. It's a massive distortion of our economy. Then, you know, Rebecca said the regulations were fine. Well, not in my book. I put these through the Liverpool model, which has the first model in the UK that has a supply side. And I asked, what happens if various sorts of labor market regulation that are favored by the EU come into play? And the answer is a huge range of, of, of problems for the British economy. You know, we had in the 80s, uh, John Fender kindly mentioned at the beginning, uh, a prime minister who got rid of a lot of market distortions in our economy, including in the labor market, particularly in the labor market. Remember, well, you, most of you won't remember, but there were very strong unions, and, and there were terrible distortions in the labor market as a result of overpriced labor and many inefficiencies in industry. The EU, in its more enthusiastic euro socialish moments why to bring an awful lot of this stuff in compulsory in the uk we fought against it i mean things like working hours restrictions which rebecca didn't mention but we fight against this stuff they want us to keep our hours to 35 35 hours maximum there's huge desire to empower unions on the continent unions are very powerful in the uk they're not very powerful because we have our own laws but these are all under risk, in fact, under the regulative desires of the, Euro, of the Euro area. Bailout, I mentioned, the, the Euro, we don't need any convincing that joining the Euro would be bad news for us. And coming with joining the Euro, come in lots of bailout issues. And finally, you know, if you've got a highly regulative kind of Euro-style social democratic framework, with a strong emphasis on using regulations in place of taxes and spending to redistribute income, you're going to have a big effect on growth. So these are my calculations, and they're based on models. And I say, yes, there are lots of the things that Rebecca said are right. But if you leave the EU, what happens is you subject those same bunch of industries to competition, world trade competition. They have to earn their living in the world market. That means you get better firms, disciplined by comparative advantage. You get foreign direct investment in the firms that are good for you, that are good, you know, the ones that you actually got a comparative advantage in. At the moment, we've got a lot of soft, underbelly firms that are protected by the EU setup. I say, let's get rid of that. The last thing that Rebecca said, and then I'm going to finish, is she talked about trade agreements. Now, this is a big bugaboo produced by the pro-EU lobby. They say, oh, golly, it's cold out there. We need loads of trade agreements. I say they don't understand international trade theory. 
In international trade theory and applied international trade theory, which gives exactly the same result of the evidence, there's something called the importance of being unimportant. If you're a small country, we're a country of 30, slightly over 30 million workers in a world of 7 billion consumers, 7 billion people. We are small. We have to compete in these markets. We have no monopoly power. We are unimportant. We'll be another unimportant economy in world trade. Now, one of the things that we learn in this is that free trade agreements are totally irrelevant to the behavior of a small country with no monopoly power. They're relevant to a big country with lots of monopoly power. Yes, the US and the EU can muscle up to each other and try to use you know, an agreement to discipline the monopoly power that they each have from their big size. If we leave the EU, we'll be a small country under world prices, which gives us a gain, and we will be, it won't matter whether we have any free trade agreements, to be quite honest. You ask Singapore, does it need trade agreements? You ask Hong Kong, does it need trade agreements? You ask Japan, how many trade agreements does that have? Not that many, because you don't need them if you're small. You've just got to produce good products. And we can do that, because We've got a deregulated economy now. We are a nation of entrepreneurs, not shopkeepers anymore. And we need to get that outside the EU. I decided not to uh, produce some slides, because I knew that by the time we got to this stage, the slides would be irrelevant. So, um, <laughs> I'm going to say a few things quickly in response to that, and then I'm going to talk about what I was going to talk about. So you know, one thing that he, he made me think of is, is there's only, of all the mainstream political parties in Europe, there's only two that are really anti-European. The right wing of the Conservative Party and the left wing of the French Socialist Party. Now, if either of those political forces were pro-European, I'd be worried. So as a kind of moderate, centrist person like most people in this room and most people in the continent. I mean, it's interesting how the, the, the right wing of the Conservative Party see Europe as some fantasy socialist plot to undermine the plucky liberal Brits and the... The, the left wing of the French Socialist Party see Europe as some nasty Anglo-Saxon free market plot to undermine the French state. Well, of course, the truth is halfway between those two things. Is Europe is actually a pretty moderate, modest social market economy that's far more liberal than the French economy, and yes, a little bit more regulatory than the British economy would be if we were out, but actually it's probably close to the, the political preferences of most European voters, and, and hence why it's only the extremes of those two parties um, the most left-wing mainstream party on the centre-left and the most right-wing part, mainstream party on the centre-right. So by background, that's where I start from. So talking about the politics, so the, the big challenge on the table is the challenge put by Lawson. Uh, uh, he wrote an article about six months ago in The Telegraph, and he said uh, the real choice for Britain is whether to be isolated inside the EU or to be isolated outside the EU. And the reason why this is such an important issue is for precisely some of the things that Bradford has talked about, which is that if the Eurozone is heading towards deeper political, fiscal, and economic union, then there are potentially enormous spillover effects of that to the other member states in the single market. And I think whoever was going to be in number 10 would be facing exactly that issue from the UK. The UK is not going to join the Euro. I don't buy the, the belief that we are obliged to join. I don't think we're obliged to join. And I think that's the same for Sweden and Denmark and several other member states. There's going to be a lot of states outside the euro for quite some time to be. But if the eurozone is going to build deeper political and economic union, there will be potentially big spillover benefits. Now, um, Lawson says, has the scenario of, imagine there's a meeting of the eurozone finance ministers on a Tuesday morning in, in Brussels, and they're trying to fix the euro, and then in the afternoon, they invite the, the finance ministers of the other member states to come into the room to come and talk about how they regulate financial services in the single market. And of course they've talked about it in the morning, and of course, or over lunch, and of course they've already done a deal that would then be imposed on the rest of us. So there's a legitimate fear, I think. But let me talk about why I think it's unlikely. Firstly, the Eurozone is not going to be building deeper, faster political and economic union anytime soon. The type of architecture they've put in place to, to save the Euro is only just enough to save the Euro. And it doesn't involve Eurozone bonds. It doesn't involve a major Euro budget or a European finance ministry or European finance minister or some new political union with a directly elected president or federalism or, or Eurozone social affairs and labour market 
ministers meeting and deciding how to regulate the Eurozone markets that would then be imposed on the rest of us. That's a sort of fantasy world that some people live in. Germany's totally opposed to that. In fact, all the Eurozone member states are opposed to it, apart from a few very small interests and groups in, on the left of the, of the German Social Democrats or the left of the French Socialists. It's just not going to happen. There's no desire for it. And even when there's the next Greek crisis that might come along, the most likely thing that will happen is Greece will have to leave the euro. It won't be a ratcheting up of deeper political and economic integration. The real game in town really is the single market, and it's going to be the single market for quite some kind of time to come. So I don't think it's irrational that Cameron then puts on the table the idea that he wants actually set in the treaties a recognition that the, euro is, the eurozone is not the EU. And if there is, let's say, a protocol attached to the treaties that does protect the single market, from deeper economic and monetary union and political union in the Eurozone. I think that's a good thing. And I actually think that is something quite substantial. I think there I agree that some of the other things he's asked for are largely just, you know, motherhood and apple pie. But but I think that some kind of legitimate protection for the single market and the states outside the Eurozone is a really important thing. But if that is put into the treaties, I think that will go a long way towards assuaging some of Lawson's concerns. The other thing I'd say is Actually, when you look over the last 10 years, as part of a project I've been doing for the ESRC, I've been looking at exactly this question, is Britain marginalised in the EU? Has Britain become more marginalised in the way the EU works? In fact, the evidence is the opposite. We're not marginalised at all. Most of the evidence we look at and collect on this shows that Britain is right at the heart of the legislative process and right at the heart of bargaining and negotiation. So, for example, research by Robert Thompson up at the University of Stirling and his collaborators, they collected over the last... 20 years, they've collected data on what are the policy outcomes <coughs> of the EU, what are the positions of the governments on those policy outcomes. And of all the member states, Britain is actually closer, on average, to the average policy outcomes from the EU than any other member state. It's a remarkable achievement. In fact, France is a long way. France is much more upset. It's not surprising if you go to Paris, they'll tell you, why are you Brits moaning about this? We've seen Europe moving in a more British direction. We've seen the single market and all the regulation of the single market moving in a more British direction. We've seen financial services regulation moving in a British direction. What are you guys moaning about? And I think the empirical evidence that Thompson and his colleagues have collected by analysing this very carefully shows this empirically. Another thing we've looked at, for example, is data collected by Daniel Nowrin in Sweden at Gothenburg University. He's collected, he's interviewed every single member of every working group in the council over the last 15 years and asked them one simple question. Which other member state do you talk to most? And they've asked it every three years. And guess what? Britain is top of the league table on this. So every other member state says, you know, we don't talk to anyone else, but they all want to talk to us. Why? Because they know that we're actually at the heart of the bargaining process. We've got very effective diplomatic service. We do very well out of the legislative process. There's no evidence at all that we're marginalised in the governance of the EU. So the idea that it's them governing us, it's Europe governing us, it's these crazy socialists on the continent who want to impose some French model of socialism on us, bloody liberal Brits, is really just nonsense. What about the financial tax? <laughs> oh, oh we, have, we don't have a financial tax. <laughs> <laughs> so what? Well, about to come in. <laughs> um, now let's think about what would happen if we left. Well, in addition to, to what Rebecca was saying, the other key thing to understand about, about what would happen if we left is the power of the European single market in the global political economy. Yes, we may be free and independent to decide what we want, but we would have to get, we would want to get access to the single market. The sing we currently trade around 50% of our trade is with the other member states in the single market. Um, and we want to get access to it, but even if we had some kind of deal like the Swiss deal or some new UK-EU free, free trade agreement that would allow us to get access to the single market, we'd be in a position to be what's called regulation takers. We would no longer be at the top table designing these regulations. Yes, they would be designing those regulations, and we would have to accept them. Let me give you an example. REACH. REACH is a, the, is a directive that regulates the production, distribution, and exchange of chemicals. The EU single market is the world's largest market for the production, distribution, and exchange of Every firm that sells anything in the European single market has to apply the REACH directive. This is having an enormous impact on American firms. American firms are now lobbying the American government for the US government to adopt the same standards. Because all the American firms that export globally have to apply these REACH standards in their production processes. 
while all the firms who apply domestically in the US don't have to apply these standards. So they said, this isn't fair. We're global firms. We have to apply these higher European standards in our production processes than the guys who just produce for the domestic market. And so they're going to be passing through Congress an equivalent of the REACH Directive domestically so that there's level playing field inside the US. This is replicated across the world in a lot of regulatory standards. You really think that us being outside the EU will be free then to design our own rules for the single market? Another one going through right now, one of my favorite ones for teaching students, is, is the regulation of cabs on lorries. So there's pressure to redesign cabs on lorries because people on bikes get killed by lorries turning and not seeing on bikes. So there's growing pressure from the bicycle lobby to redesign the, the cabs on lorries so that the, the window goes down further so the guy driving the truck can see the bicycle as they turn. And Boris actually went off to Brussels to lobby in favour of this, the Boris being Boris's bikes, right? So um, you think that if the EU passes this, this then doesn't immediately become the global standard. Every truck manufacturer in the world will have to apply this global standard, including all the car manufacturers and truck manufacturers. So this is the power, the global power of the EU single market, which would not change much if we were outside the EU. We would end up being regulation takers without a seat at that top table, being at the heart of the bargaining uh, negotiations. How much longer? About, about a minute. About a minute. Uh, finally, one thing I do agree with Patrick. <laughs> the EU is a political project. Of course it's a political project. The single market is political. There's something qualitatively different between a single market and a free trade area. And it's, it's, I, I, I have a luxury of being invited to go to other parts of the world to try and explain to them how to get a single market. ASEAN would love to have a single market. Latin America would love to have a single market. The Mexicans and the Canadians would love to turn NAFTA into a single market. The reason they can't is because they can't design the political institutions and have the political will to create it. A free trade means you trade in a subset of goods and services. A single market means that you actually get rid of your barriers for the free movement of goods, services, capital, and labor. That is a political decision, and it requires political institutions and political commitment and common shared political values to be able to do that. So you can come up with common environment standards, common social standards, common ways, common rules on the treatment of people in the workplace. So you can create a common level playing field. You need a set of political institutions to do that, you need checks and balances. The EU is a political project. Creating a single market is a political project. We shouldn't be ashamed of that. That this uh, debate, the decision on whether to stay in uh, the European Union or to leave it, uh, will not be settled by the debate between economists. Uh, because it is very difficult to, to judge uh, what is right. And that is also the case. I think Simon said this at the end that the EU primarily was not set up as an economic project. It was a political project, and still is a political project, uh, set up uh, for extraordinarily good reasons. The members who set it up, and with the exception of the United Kingdom and Sweden, really, those members who joined uh, the EU since, joined because the national states had failed. They'd been either fascist, communist, they've been invaded, controlled by another uh, country. And so the electorates and the political elites in those countries no longer trusted uh, both the electorate and their national institutions. And so for good reasons, they set up uh, the Iron Steel uh, Federation and then, uh, and then the EC and then the European Union as a way of protecting themselves from the appalling history of Europe in the uh, first half of the uh, 20th century. Whether we need those institutions now, I don't think we do, because they're essentially anti-democratic. Uh, in the final analysis of whether something is democratic or not, can you throw the rascals out who are proposing the legislation and making uh, the laws and rules? The answer is no. So it fails that pretty uh, fundamental test. The reason the United Kingdom joined in the first case, and Patrick referred to this, was that, and I wouldn't agree with Margaret Thatcher's 
solutions necessarily, but we can agree that uh, in the 1970s uh, and the late 1960s, the United Kingdom was a bit of an economic basket case in, in the sense that it uh, no longer is. But because the European Union is primarily a political project, uh, if you look internationally, the EU is now the, uh, the economic uh, basket case. Where it is the continent that is growing most slowly. Uh, the desire for political reasons to have the euro has meant that every country within the euro, with the exception of Germany, is now follow having deflationary policies forced upon them to the point of view where Greece, by any normal test, no longer really exists as a sovereign country that can decide uh, its own policies. So the destruction of Greece, the condemning of whole generations of young people in Spain, Portugal, Greece, Italy, to unemployment is a direct result of the politics overruling uh, the economics within the uh, EU. And it is basically putting the EU project above uh, what those countries would choose to do uh, themselves. I think we, we've heard from the economists about there are real benefits of being outside, there are real benefits of being inside. There's an open Europe study, uh, which, a recent open Europe study, which said that depending on what you do, there are 2.8% uh, loss of GDP for leaving, or on the other hand, there might be a 1.8% GDP gain for joining. Actually, the record that economists, politicians, generally people who <coughs> predict things, is rather poor. Nobody predicted uh, the Arab Spring, nobody predicted uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of uh, Eastern Europe. We're just not very good at doing uh, that kind of thing. We are very good at understanding how we can improve our own situation. <coughs> there are two final points, I, well, two major points I want to talk about. Simon talked about influence. And it is often said, in the case that Simon made, that we have more influence within the EU than we have without it. I think there are, uh, numerically, just because the EU has got bigger, in round terms, our percentage vote, these aren't exactly, just looking at it, essentially has gone from 20% to 10%, to 8% or so, in some bodies and 12.5% uh, in, in other bodies. When this has been tested 55 times since 1996 in the council meetings, the United Kingdom has lost every single uh, vote. The difficulty with testing these things objectively is often compromises are made beforehand. So it is extremely difficult to measure influence. But when actual votes have been taken, you can see that uh, we have uh, lost. It is also said, and I don't accept Simon's view, that the world will follow the regulations of the European Union. Most regulations, the World Trade Organization, the people that regulate uh, agricultural rules applying to sheep and all banking finance, are increasingly made at the world level not at the European level, where this country is represented by the EU, often uh, by countries whose natural interests are very different uh, from this country. So, and as a free self-governing company, a country, we could represent ourselves in those circumstances. That is a great deal more influence being sat at the table where regulations are really made, rather than having them done second hand when we're only 10% of the vote. The final point, and it's the largest point, and I think it's, it's the most important debate, is it's about democracy. Can, can we change the European Union? It's quite clear that David Cameron doesn't think we can change the European Union into something better. That's a measure of how little little control as a whole country the Prime Minister has. He started off by saying that he wanted a fundamental 
change in the treaties and the change in the structure of the EU, and we're now asking for relatively trivial cosmetic uh, changes in how the uh, EU is structured and governed. Another way of looking at how undemocratic it is, this country has had a history of parliamentary democracy where one government cannot bind what the next government does. Uh, Margaret Thatcher's government in that sense is no more important than Tony Blair's or David Cameron's. If those governments want to change the rules, then they can do. That is not true of the European Union. There is a one-way ratchet uh, of rules and treaties that are impossible uh, to unpick. Once they've got into treaties, they're there forever. I think that's uh, fundamentally anti-democratic. There are no other parts of the world, not South America, not North America, not Asia, that are looking to set up a similar structure to this, where sovereign states hand over power uh, to not just to other sovereign states, but to a, a, a political in, uh, a political elite to structure the laws of that area. It's not surprising uh, that they don't do that. Now, while I don't think, and I'm going to do it, it's interesting being in an academic environment, that almost the most important issue in the public's mind that will determine which way people vote in this uh, referendum is migration. It's, I, I can't think of going to another forum where what will probably sway more minds than the, the extraordinarily well presented arguments about the economy uh, will be migration. A lot of people are worried about their jobs, their communities because of migration. I'll just say two things, okay, three things about this uh, to finish on. One, those people who believe that we should close our borders, I think that's a stupid position to take. And I think it is just as stupid a position to say that we should always have, we should have completely open borders. The implication of that, if you accept that those two positions are not good <coughs> positions to take, is somebody has to control the borders. And I think that is better done by the United Kingdom, because effectively, if the United Kingdom doesn't control the borders, when you have a twelfth of the world's population residing within the European Union and with many open borders. And if anybody wants to doubt the borders are open, go and read Hansard about the admission of Croatia to the European Union when all the evidence was there, which we've now seen, was that not only was that a portal into the European Union uh, for uh, people trafficking, the border was essentially open. And what we're seeing now uh, is not a surprise. So I think we should control our borders and we should decide who comes in. And it is interesting that being in the EU makes it much more difficult, not just to trade, to trade and buy agricultural products from Africa, but for those countries that have been long, have long relationships with this country, it is much more difficult for people from Eastern Africa and elsewhere to come into this country when they have had a long relationship uh, than it is for people from Eastern Europe who have had a much more shallow relationship with this country. So I think those are the real issues. Do we want to govern ourselves? Yes. Are we likely to be better off economically? Nobody knows. There are risks both ways. But I think that in all probability, making decisions about our own economy uh, for ourselves is likely to lead to a much more prosperous society than having other people make those decisions. Okay, thank you very much to um, the four speakers. Um, this is an important uh, um, question in front of ordinary voters. Uh, your opinion matters just as much as the opinion of experts. We collected, John and I collected this panel of uh, expert opinions so that you can ask some questions.